Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake in Meet Me in St. Louis. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The theme song of tonight's play is the title of Metro Golden Mare's screen hit, Meet Me in St. Louis, based on the novel of the same name by Sally Benson, currently playing in theaters all over the country. The title refers, of course, to the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. Ten million people attended it, but twice as many people in our listening audience will be going there tonight with three of Hollywood's most charming stars, Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake. They take you back to an era of nostalgic charm in a warm and haunting story of romance. And in that same nostalgic spirit comes a letter from a young girl who was married last September in a family heirloom dress of Maltese lace. The lace, she says, was very delicate and 97 years old. Yet when we washed it with Lux Flakes just before the wedding, it came out perfectly preserved in color, daintiness, and texture. We were astonished that a lace so old and delicate could be so beautifully restored. To Mrs. T.A. Gunderson, the bride, our heartiest thanks, and our sincere best wishes for a happy future with Lux Flakes. On to Act One of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland as Esther, Margaret O'Brien as Tootie, and Tom Drake as John, with Gail Gordon as Alonzo. In the year 1903, there lived in the city of St. Louis a family named Smith. There were Mr. and Mrs. Alonzo Smith and Grandpa Smith. There were also two daughters and a son, Rose, Esther, and Lonnie. Oh, yes, and another daughter, Tootie, aged seven, who at this moment perches next to Mr. Costello on Mr. Costello's ice wagon. My goodness, Tootie, at five o'clock. Giddy up, be dressed. Oh, how's your doll feeling now, Tootie? Any better? Oh, no. Poor Margaretha. I've never seen her look so pale. Mm, probably the heat. Been awful hot today. I doubt very much if Margaretha will live through the night. She has four fatal diseases. Mm, as rule, only takes one. She's going to have a beautiful funeral in a cigar box my papa gave me, all wrapped up in silver paper. Mm, that's the way to go if you got to go. Oh, she's got to go. How's Beatrice feeling? Oh, Beatrice don't mind the heat. Why, she's the strongest horse in St. Louis. Excuse me, Mr. Costello, but it's pronounced St. Louis. That's funny. Now you take that their new song. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis, meet me. Oh, well, that's different. We sing that song all the time in our house. My sister Esther and my sister Rose and Grandpa and everybody. Well, St. Louis to St. Louis, it's still a grand old town. It's not a town, Mr. Costello. It's a city, and it's the only city that's going to have a World's Fair. Gosh, wasn't I lucky to be born in my favorite city? You sure were, honey. So was I, and so was Beatrice. Is that right, Beatrice? Come on, gal. Giddy up. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis, me. At the fair Don't tell me The lights are shining Any place but there We will dance The hoochie coochie You will be My tootsie wootsie If you will meet me In St. Louis Louis Meet me At the fair Rose and sing. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis. Meet me at the fair. Don't tell me the lights are shining. Any hey, place hey, but there. Oh, hello, Papa. Did you just come home, Papa? The fair won't open for months, but that's all everybody talks about or sings about. Where's Mama? Here I am, dear. Well, did you have a nice day, Alonzo? I had a terrible day, Anna. I lost the case. Oh, dear. Oh, well, Papa, if losing a case depresses you so, why don't you give up law and go into some other business? All right, Esther, I will. 
Beginning tomorrow, I intend to play first base for the Baltimore Orioles. Right now, I'm going to soak in a cool bath for one solid hour. Oh, but that's impossible, Papa. Katie's serving dinner in five minutes. Five minutes? Alonzo, we, we planned on eating an hour earlier tonight. I'm taking a bath. Oh, Rose, dear, I'm so oh, sorry. But it's nothing to upset the entire household about. Warren Sheffield, a Yale man, is going to telephone you at 6.30, and you say it's nothing. Rose, the telephone's in the dining room. You certainly don't want the whole family sitting there drinking in every word when a man proposes long distance. I don't see why you assume Warren is going to propose to me. He's calling from New York. Do you know what that costs? Now, I think that's just about enough of this. Now, where's Tootie? Oh, she's delivering ice with Mr. Costello. No, she came back a few minutes ago. She's in the backyard burying her doll. Well, call her in and see that she gets washed. And Lonnie. Lonnie! Now, don't you worry, Rose, dear. Everything will work out all right. Mama, it's 6.30 and Papa isn't down yet. He will be. Tootie! Grandpa! Lonnie, come on, dinner! Has he telephoned yet, Rose? Grandpa, I'm not in the least concerned whether Mr. Sheffield calls or not. I suppose Warren's too young, huh? Every fella I introduce her to is too young. Now, listen, children. Your father will be right down. If we eat dinner quickly, we may be finished by the time... Oh, 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 now I remember. Now I remember where I left my other roller skate. On the staircase. I hope I haven't held you up. I was just taking a little ride before dinner. <laughs> Tootie, is this your roller skate? Yes, Papa. Thank you. You're welcome. And remind me to spank you after dinner. Yes, Papa. Ah, soup. Don't blame me if it's cold, Mr. Smith. Oh, Katie. So is the corned beef. No, no, no. It's fine. Delicious. Well, what's the matter with everybody? Eat your soup. Oh, 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 Rose, let me get it. Telephone, telephone. What are you all jumping for? Sit still. I'll answer it. I'll die. I'll simply die. Hello? What? New York? No, I'm not calling New York. What? Hello? 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 Anna, I'm going to have that instrument of torture ripped out of this home. Oh, Alonzo, every telephone call's not for you, dear. Rose is crying. Well, what's the matter with you? (laughs) Oh, it's nothing, Papa. You've just ruined Rose's chances to get married, that's all. What did you say? That was Warren Sheffield calling long distance to propose. Oh, I see. Tootie? Did you know there was a long-distance call coming to this house? You know what, Papa? The Iceman saw a drunkard get shot yesterday, and blood spurted out three feet Answer yes or no. Yes. Lon? Grandpa? Anna? Well, and just when was I voted out of this family? Oh, Alonzo, really now that... My eldest daughter is practically on her honeymoon, and everybody in St. Louis knows about it but me. Well, from now on, I'll handle all telephone calls to this house. But, Papa... Nobody answers the phone but me. But I... Thank you. Rose, answer the telephone. Thank you, Papa. Hello, Warren? How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Rose. How St. Louis? What did you say? I said, how St. Louis? Oh, it's fine. Uh, Fine. Uh, Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you fine. The whole neighborhood can hear you. Well, uh... What did you say, Warren? Nothing, uh, nothing. I was waiting for you to say something. Oh. Uh, Rose, I... I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to tell you. Yes? Well, I... I don't think you should mention this call to your family. Why not? Well, because there'd be H to pay if my family ever found out I called you long distance. Oh, oh he said there'd be H. And my family's here and they don't think anything of it. Well, I'd better not waste any more of your time or money. Rose, I've still got 35 Never seconds. Never mind. Well, Rose, I'll... I'll write to you as soon as I hang up. Well, that'll be very nice. Goodbye, Warren. Well, that's the darndest proposal I ever heard. Oh, well, of all things, she's talked about the weather. Well, I'll bet there isn't another girl in St. Louis who's had a Yale man call her long distance just to inquire about her health. If, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to be excused. A Yale man, eh, Lonnie? Yes, Papa. That settles it. You're going to Princeton. It's nice just sitting on the front porch, isn't it, Rose? I just love a summer night. Esther wasn't that silly of me, running away from the dinner table. Oh, Rose, I wish I had your... your savoir faire. Esther, look. Hmm? Next door, our new neighbor. John Truitt! He's on the lawn. Now, for goodness sakes, don't let on that we see him. Ready? Yes. Let's, Let's get a little closer to the railing. Isn't it a gorgeous night, Esther, dear? 
Heavenly Rose, just heavenly. He smokes a pipe. I understand they're having a fashion pavilion at the fair. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I shan't be at all surprised if Joe insists on taking me to the fair every single night. Joe's so overpowering. Oh, prune. Huh? Well, look, he just walked back into his house. Oh. It's not very neighborly, I must say. Well, he's only lived here two weeks. You can't expect him to fling himself at you. How am I going to meet him? I know. I'll get George Briggs to bring him over here to Lon's going away party. Oh, Rose, could you? Of course. Let me get some stationery. We can write the invitations right now, tonight. He didn't even notice me. What if he can't come to our party? What if he's got a girl? The moment I saw him smile, I knew he was just my style. My only regret is we've never met, though I dream of him all the while. But he doesn't know I exist No matter how I may persist So it's clear to see There's no hope for me Though I live at 5135 Kensington Avenue And he lives at 5133 how can I ignore the boy next door? I love him more than I can say. Doesn't try to please me, doesn't even tease me, and he never sees me glance his way. And though I'm heart sore, the boy next door, affection for me won't display. I just adore him, so I can't ignore him. The boy next door. My dear Mr. Truitt, you are cordially invited to a party on Saturday next in honor of our brother, Alonzo Smith, Jr., who is living for Princeton. Cordially yours, Rose Smith. How's that, Es? Well, it's pretty formal. But I guess we'd be, better be pretty formal to start with. Huh? Oh, Princeton's a peach of a school. A peach of a school. Well, that's where I'm going. I... Oh, Esther. Yes, Alonzo? Uh, may I present our neighbor, John Truitt? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the name. John Truitt. Oh, <laughs> well, welcome to our house, Mr. Truitt. Well, thank you. You know, this is the first party I've been invited to since we moved to St. Louis. Oh, do you live here? Well, of course he lives here, right next door. Oh, well, that's where I've seen you. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> if this dance isn't taken, Miss Smith, I'd be very honored. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but I... Oh, well, since you're our next-door neighbor. Thank you. Oh, Miss Esther. Uh, yes, Mr. Truitt. There's a mouse in the house. Hmm? Look, on the hall stairs. 
Why, Tootie Smith, why aren't you asleep? There was too much noise down here. Noise? We've just been dancing and singing. I want to sing, too. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> well, all right, just one song. Now, what would you like to sing, darling? Baby's Boat? Or did you ever see a rabbit climb a tree? Or... Oh, I hate those songs. I want to sing a new one. I was, hmm, last night, dear mother. <laughs> well, you can't sing that. Oh, do let her. She's such a sweet little thing. Sweet? She's a little hoodlum. Oh, oh, let sing. oh well, all right. Go ahead, Tootie. I was drunk last night, dear mother. I was drunk the night before. But if you'll forgive me, mother, I'll never get drunk anymore. <laughs> Tootie, you're a very bad little girl. <laughs> it's really Lon's fault, Mr. Truett. He teaches her those things. Now, Tootie, you scoot right up to bed this instant. Uh, Rose, oh, Rose, dear, might we have some dance music, please? Oh, yes. <laughs> Looks like I'm the last one leaving. Uh, well, uh, good night, Miss Esther. Uh, good night. Yes, oh, don't forget your beauty sleep. Presently, Rose, dear. Well, I guess I'd better get going. Uh, well, uh, we'll be seeing some more of you, won't we? Oh, you bet. You, you'll be joining our crowd Friday. We're all taking the trolley out to the fairgrounds just to see what progress they're making. Oh, sure, sure. Well... Good night. Good night. Oh, uh, that Welch rabbit you served was ginger peachy. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. Oh, uh, Mr. Truett. Uh, yes, Miss Esther? Uh, this is a, an untoward request, but would you mind accompanying me through the house while I turn out the lights? Well, I... It's just that I, uh, uh I'm afraid of mice. <laughs> well, sure, sure. That's the least a man can do for his charming host. Those two lights in the hall, and then we'll be finished. Oh, if you can't see, just take my hand, Mr. Truitt. Well, uh, thanks. This way. Say, uh, mm, that's nice perfume. Do you like it? It's essence of violet. Uh, exactly the same kind my grandmother uses. Uh, no, this is different. <laughs> well, here's the hall. Uh, hadn't we better save those lights for your folks? Well, I'll just turn them down dim. There. My, it's certainly dark in here with the lights off, isn't it? Gosh, Miss Esther, I hope I'm not too presumptuous, but you don't need any beauty sleep. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Oh, this has been a great evening. I'll never forget it. Do you mean that? Yes, yes, I do. Do you always... Shake hands with the girl when you say goodnight? Oh, no, no, sir. Only when I... Well, when I think an awful lot of her. Oh. A and you know something else, Esther? What? You've got a mighty strong grip for a girl. <laughs> Good night, Esther. Good night, neighbor. Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake will return for Act Two of Meet Me in St. Louis in a moment. Say, Libby, a boy wants to know whether his girl will like him better if he becomes a great dancer like Fred Astaire or a famous crooner like Bing Crosby. Well, why not tell him to see Paramount's new picture, Blue Skies? They're both in that, and they both love the same girl, Joan Carfield. Frankly, if I'd been Joan in that picture, I never could have made up my mind. Those wonderful sentimental tunes Bing sings should sweep any girl off her feet. Mm, just like an Astaire dance. Isn't this Fred's farewell to pictures? Well, that's what he insists, but millions hope it isn't true. He's never been better or his dance is more original. Being Astaire's partner is a real honor. Well, he has two in Blue Skies. Blonde Joan Caulfield and a little Latin from Manhattan, Olga San Juan. Both are divine in technicolor. I'll bet I know another thing they had in common. What's that? Lux care for their stockings. Oh, you're absolutely right. Anybody who dances knows how much strain stockings get. So naturally, the girls use Lux flakes to cut down runs. Not only girls who dance, Libby, but girls everywhere know how much longer Lux stockings last. And so do Paramount Studios. 
Stockings for the chorus got the same Lux care as those of the stars. But, of course, Joan knew about Lux long before she went to Hollywood. Wasn't she a model in New York? That's right. And models soon learned to get more wear from stockings by luxing them every night. Well, actual strain tests proved how right they are. In these tests, stockings rubbed with cake soap went into runs very quickly. The luxed ones lasted and lasted. Twice as long, in fact. Girls on a budget appreciate that. Right, Libby. Now, a suggestion to the ladies of our audience. Because Lux is made of scarce materials, please don't waste it. Here's your producer, William Keeley. Act two of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland as Esther, Margaret O'Brien as Tootie, and Tom Drake as John. Well, Friday's come, and with it, the trolley ride to the fairgrounds. Now take a trolley, fill it with boys and girls, and sooner or later, somebody's singing. In this instance, it's Miss Hester Smith, who finds ample reason to sing. Dyed in sagging pants, a long red nose, and bristling mustaches, Miss Tootie Smith is about to brave the thrills and terrors of this ghost-ridden night. And will you see what I do to Mr. Brockoff? Do you know what Mr. Brockoff does, Esther? Minds his own business, as far as I know. He buys meat and poison, and then he puts it all together and kills cats, thousands of cats. And when he's not killing cats, he beats his wife with a red-hot poker. My goodness. Glennie Travis told me. Are you going out with Glennie and the rest of those ragamuffins? They're all down at the corner. They got a big red bonfire. That's so the banshees will know where to come. I'm going to oh. go, and Oh, dear. Oh, oh don't my. be afraid, Mama. It's only me. Oh. oh, why, I thought some horrible ghost had come into the house. Oh, I'm horrible, all right. I was murdered last week in a den of thieves. <gasps> Here it is, Judy. Here's oh. your flower. Thanks, Grandpa. You wouldn't catch me out on a night like this for a million dollars. Why not? Too many terrible spirits roaming around. Grandpa. Oh, go on, Tootie. It's Halloween. I just hope I get back to my bed and board all right. If you wet the flower before you throw it, it's harder for the victims to get it off. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Well, all right, everybody. I guess we're all ready to go. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Mrs. Wilkins said she'd leave her hammock on the front porch. And would the children please bring it back after they're through stealing it? Maybe we will and maybe we won't. Anyway, you ain't coming. Why not? Because you're too little, Tootie. Hey, who's going to take the Brokoff's house? Not me. Mr. Brokoff's got a great big beard. And a great big bulldog. And he poisons cats and beats oh, his wife. Oh, Tootie, and... why don't you go home? Well, somebody's got to take the Brokoff's. I'll take him. I'll take the Brokoff's. Oh, oh Dad, Dad, I don't want to go on, Tootie. Go on, on home till you grow up. I won't go home. I won't. I'm going to take the Brokoff's. I'll torture him good and pull their roof down. Well, you got some flour? Yes. Just remember, if you don't hit Mr. Brockoff in the face with a flower and say, I hate you, the Banshees will haunt you forever. They will? Well, what did you think? Well, here I go. And come back when your mission is over. We'll be meeting here around the fiery furnace. Oh, Lordy, I sure wish Esther was here. I can't do it. I can't. I'm too scared. Well, what do you want? Don't try to run away. Yes, Mr. Brockoff. Did you ring my doorbell, ghost? Yes, sir. Well, go on. Throw the flower on me. Oh, all right. Some more. On my beard. Yes, sir. Now say it. Say it. I, I hate you, Mr. Brockoff. That's fine, Tootie. Good night, dear. <laughs> I'm the most horrible. I'm the most horrible of everybody. Is that you, Judy? I'm coming. Well, did you have a nice... But, Glennie... Esther, you better come quick. Something happened to Tootie. What are you talking about? Down by the trolley. She got hurt, Esther. She's bleeding like anything. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Esther, did you get Pop on the telephone? No, Mama, they said he just left. It's Tootie's lip, Mama. It's all cut. Oh, good heavens. And a tooth knocked out. Oh, Katie, another compress. There, there, darling. Everything's going to be fine. He tried to kill me. Why, Tootie. She must mean the streetcar. I think it hit her. It wasn't the streetcar. 
It was John Truitt. Oh, John no. Truitt? John Truitt? He was going to kill me. That's how I got hurt. When I screamed, he ran away. What? Tootie Smith, that's a monstrous falsehood. Now, wait a minute, Tootie. What's that in your hand? Why, why it's some strands of hair. Yes, and I don't think it's Tootie's. I yanked it out of his head. He tried to kill me. Brown hair. John Truitt has brown hair. Excuse me. Oh, is that you, Esther? Oh, hello, Esther. John Truitt. Yes? Hey, wait a minute. I've come here to ask you something. Hey, cut it out, Esther. The next time you put hey, on, cut somebody, it out. Pick on somebody your own size, what do you mean hitting a seven-year-old child? Esther! If there's anything I hate, loathe, despise, and abominate, it's a bully! I want to sleep in Esther's bed, Mama. Of course, darling. Oh, I hate to think what your father's going to say when he hears about this. He may even strike that Truitt boy. He won't have to, Mama. I just took care of him. I was drunk last night, dear Mother. I was drunk the night before. Esther, your dress. Oh, that must have happened when he was trying to hold me off. I bit him. I bit him, too. Did you, Tootie? That's not what Tommy Berkheimer says. I've just been talking to him. Did the trolley go off the gra- tracks, Grandpa? No, but the cable came off when the motorman put on the brakes so fast. At least that's what Tommy tells me. What are you talking about? It seems the kids had found an old suit of clothes, so they stuffed it with straw and somebody put it on the trolley tracks. We thought the car would go off the tracks. Tootie Smith, why, you're nothing less than a murderess. You might have killed dozens of people. Oh, Rose, you're so stuck up. Tootie, how did you get that lip? How? Because John Truett butted in. He dragged me up an alley so the policeman wouldn't get me. Huh. As though policemen never pay attention to girls. But I yanked his hair out and got away. Then I fell down and cut my lip. Oh, what I'm going to do to you. Oh, yes, leave her alone. <laughs> well, bro, what's so funny? Tootie, honestly, you're the most deceitful, sinful little creature I've ever seen. And for two cents, I'd... <laughs> Merciful heavens. John... Oh, no, Esther, not again, please. Oh, John, John, there's been a terrible mistake. There has? Oh, yes, you see, I... Oh, did I do that? Black eye, and this, and this, and this. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's all right. How's Tootie? <laughs> oh, she'll live. <laughs> oh, John, it's, it's awfully nice of you to accept my apology. Well, if you're not busy tomorrow night, could you beat me up again? <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess I better be getting home. Oh, uh, before you go, would you mind helping me turn out the lights? I'm afraid of mice. <laughs> Looks like most of the lights are out. Wouldn't take a minute to turn them on again. Well, wouldn't that be kind of wasting a minute? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it would, Esther. Oh. You know, you've got a mighty strong grip for a boy. If I ever catch you fibbing again, Tootie, I'll give you something that you'll... Oh, Esther, dear, I hope... Why, Esther, is there something wrong? Yes, Mama. Roses are red and John's name is Tootie. Esther's in love, and we always knew oh, it. Mama, can't you make Tootie stop? Is this where the Smith family lives? Why, hello. Come on in. Hello. Well, home, Papa. I almost got killed. We stopped the trolley, and I lost my tooth, and Esther bit John Truett. And Anna. Tootie <laughs> fell, dear, and cut her lip. She's fine. Oh, that's a brave little girl, Tootie. Oh, uh, Anna, for you. Why, Alonzo, what a lovely box of candy. Is anything wrong? <laughs> Anna, the firm is sending me to New York. Well, that's lovely, dear. Just as long as you'll be home for Thanksgiving. No, you don't understand. I'm to head the office there. We're moving to New York. Moving? To New York? Well, I don't believe it. Well, I simply don't believe Why, it. Why, Anna, I thought you'd be overjoyed. But New York is such a big city, and, well, what'll the children do? The same as they do here. Go to school, play, have their friends over. 
What friends, Alonzo? Yes, what friends? The friends they'll meet in New York. And Tootie, just ready to be promoted. And Esther, a senior. I've worked all my life to be a senior. And Rose in the Conservatory of Music. Yes, what about me in my life? You can take that with you. It's settled. We're going. Well, I must say you're being very cold-blooded. Well, I've got our future to think about. I've got to worry about where the money's coming from. With Lon in Princeton and Rose in Music School and Tootie... Money. I hate, loathe, despise, and abominate money. You also spend it. And what about Katie and Grandpa and the chickens? Not that we have many left. That's a minor detail we can discuss later. So I'm a minor detail, am I? You know very well, Papa, I was talking about the chickens. Oh, never mind what happens to your family, as long as the chickens are provided for. Now, 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 I guess we're all a little excited. We'll talk this over calmly tomorrow. Well, what's this? Hickory nut cake, as only Katie can make it. Oh, I can't go to New York. I simply can't. I'm taking my cat. Winona goes wherever I go. Well, you keep her cooped up in a tenement. Oh, good evening, Katie. Couldn't help overhearing. Don't they have houses in New York? Rich people have houses. People like us live in flats. Thousands of people in one building. And what about the World's Fair? Yes, just when St. Louis is going to be the center of, intra- of attraction of the entire universe. Katie, this cake is as light as a feather. You can bake anything in our stove. They got little box stoves in them tenements. <clears throat> uh, pass your plates, everybody. Have some cake. Thanks. I guess I got some things to do. Excuse me. Oh, you going up too, Grandpa? I, uh, I'll help Katie with the ice cream dishes, Mom. Me too. As long as we're moving, it won't matter if I break some. <sighs> Aren't you afraid, Anna? Alone in this room with a a criminal? Now, dear, if you think it's best to move to New York, why why that's what we'll do. Eat your cake, Alonzo. Ah, it's good to hear you play, Anna. My, that's a nice song. Remember when I used to sing it? Yes. Guess we'll have some cake after all. I want the piece with the rose petals. Mighty nice song. Mighty nice. Rose and I. Well, there's nothing like good music and a piece of hickory cake. No, sir. <laughs> New York is is going to be just just fine. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake, will follow in a moment. Our guest tonight, blonde, blue-eyed Lola Deem, came to Hollywood from Akron, Ohio, by way of Chicago. When MGM saw the screen test she made there, they lost no time in getting her to the coast. I understand you're studying hard, Lola. I am, Mr. Keeley, but I'm having fun, too. Such as? Oh, watching pictures being made... And seeing as many previews at the studios as possible, that's where I saw the yearling, Metro Golden Mayer's new Technicolor picture, which people are talking about for the Academy Award. Mm, a superb example of fine acting and photography. And how I envy Jane Wyman in her role opposite Gregory Peck. Oh, oh a Gregory Peck <laughs> fan, eh? Mm, who isn't? And Claude Jarman, Jr., is so appealing as Jody with his pet fawn. Well, it's often the details that count in making a successful picture, Lola. For instance, the company spent months in Florida to make each sequence in the yearling true to life. Tell me, Lola, do you have any special rule for success? Yes, Mr. Keeley, to profit by experience. And I'm doing that right now. How is that, Lola? Well, when I was working as a radio receptionist back east, I found that good grooming was important. So, naturally, I used Lux Flakes. You see, 
I was on a budget, and I saved a lot by wearing blouses and sweaters I could luxe myself. They always looked wonderful. Hollywood studios feel much the same way about Lux, Miss Dean. They've discovered by actual experience how safe it is for colors. So they make it a rule to use Lux flakes for everything washable. Well, I do too, but I wish I could find more Lux in the Hollywood stores. <laughs> well, the materials they need to make Lux are scarce. But it's wise to keep on trying. Smart girls like yourself don't risk spoiling nice things with a strong soap. Because they know washing things the wrong way can fade colors easily. Tests on all sorts of fabrics proved that. There's no doubt about it. Lux things do stay smart longer. Thank you for coming tonight, Miss Lola Deem. We return you now to William Keeley. Act three of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland as Esther, Margaret O'Brien as Tootie, and Tom Drake as John. It's the day before Christmas, a week before the family moves to New York, and five hours before the annual Christmas ball at the Women's Club. And Alonzo Smith, Jr., home from Princeton for the holidays, has a problem. Oh, Lonnie, you needn't be so grouchy just because Lucille Ballard doesn't think you're good enough to take her to the dance tonight. A girl has a right to go to a dance with anyone she wants. I, I just didn't ask her soon enough. Everyone knows Miss Ballard is just an Eastern snob. Well, you're in a fine mood, all because Warren Sheffield asked her instead of you. That's not true. Rose could have had any man she wanted. Except Warren Sheffield. Everyone knows that Lucille Ballard is just throwing herself at Warren because of his father's money. Now, that's what I call real Christmas spirit. Now, just a minute, Katie. Didn't it ever occur to you that you might take your sister to the dance? My own brother. I'd be the laughing stock of St. Louis. Well, thank you. Oh, Katie's absolutely right. Oh, Lon, it's our last dance in St. Louis, and it'd be tragic if either of you missed it. It's all right for you to talk. You have a date, a real one. Well, Rose, if I didn't have a date with John... John Truett, which I have, I'd be thrilled to go with my own brother. Well, I'd be willing, Rose. I mean, I'd be glad to. You would? <laughs> Why, you two will have the best time of anybody. You won't even have to be polite to each other. Now, hurry, yes, it's half past seven. Oh, oh yes, you look grand, oh. simply grand. That oh. corset makes your figure just elegant. Oh, I feel elegant. But I can't breathe. But if we're going to wreck Lucille Ballard's evening, we definitely need every ounce of allure. Oh, Rose, don't you think I could be alluring without a corset? No, Esther, I don't. After all, you're competing with an Eastern girl. We'll have to monopolize all the worthwhile men. <sighs> well, there'll only be about 20 boys worth looking at. We could certainly handle 20 men. But what about John Truett? Oh, I'll devote myself to John. But in between times, I'm going to make my presence felt amongst the others. Oh, Esther. What is it, Tootie? Somebody at the back door to see you. Who? <laughs> Gosh, do you look funny. Oh, Tootie. Rose, could I please wear a corset, now, too? Tootie. Who's at the back door? Oh, somebody that looks like John Truett. Oh, oh, Rose, give me my kimono. I wonder what he could want. What are you giving me for Christmas, Rose? You'll find out tomorrow. I certainly hope it's a hunting knife. Nothing I need worse than a good hunting knife. Oh, John. Well, come on in. Yes, I've got some bad news. My, my tuxedo. Well, what about it? It's at the tailor's. You see, I was playing basketball, and when I got there, it was closed. But can't you borrow one? I've tried, but everybody who's got one is going to the ball. What about your father's? That was my father's. Well, then find the tailor and make him open the shop. Well, I know his name is Johnson, but I don't know where he lives. Oh. Oh, this is simply ghastly. Oh, yes, I wouldn't blame you if you never spoke to me again. Oh, well, you, you didn't do it on purpose. I guess there's nothing else I can say, unless you want to do something else tonight. No, I, I better just stay home and do some packing. You know, we're leaving St. Louis in a few days. I know. And this is a fine going away present I'm giving you. I'll bet you really hate me. Oh, no, John, I don't hate you. I just hate basketball. Simply awful, Esther. I wish I were dead, that's all. Well, there's only one thing to do. Lon will have to take both of us. You don't think I'm going to the smartest ball of the season with my own brother, do well, you? I like that. You wanted me to go with you. You didn't have a 
good day. But I can't handle 20 men alone. I admit it. Did you ever stop to think of what people would come say? In. Come in, Grandpa. You know, the man that built this house cheated your father. The walls are thin as paper. Oh, Grandpa. Now, now, now. <laughs> Esther, it's a funny thing. I took my tuxedo out of the mothballs only yesterday. Looked pretty good, too. That suit of mine does the greatest one step you ever saw. Grandpa, are you actually... Esther, what's this toot he says about you're not going to the dance? Who says I'm not going? Of course I'm going. With the handsomest man in town. Madame, I'll pick you up at eight. Esther, Esther, I'm here. I John. made it. Oh, gosh, yes. I didn't find Mr. Johnson until 20 minutes at 10. But he opened up the shop, and well, here I am. Oh, John, so much has happened, and I'm so glad. And if I'm crying, it's just because everything's turned out so simply divinely, and it's Christmas almost. And I... But what's happened? No, don't you see them dancing? Rose and Warren Sheffield. Miss Ballard's a simply charming girl, even if she is an Easterner. She said we're all grown up, aren't we? And since all Warren talks about is Rose, my goodness, why doesn't he fill her dance card? Who's Lucille dancing with? Oh, Lonnie, of course. Oh, she's terribly fond of him. It's really so obvious. And now you're here. Oh, John, I've never been so happy in my life. Esther... Could we... Could we go outside for a minute? I want to talk to you. Well, of course, John, if you like. Oh, I wouldn't have said it, Esther, if I thought it would make you cry again. Are, are you sure you're warm enough? Uh -huh. Oh, I've imagined you saying it thousands of times that... I always planned exactly how I'd act. I never planned to cry. Well, at least you didn't laugh. Laugh? I guess I never asked a girl to marry me before. I guess maybe I was kind of... Oh, well... John, no one could have done it more beautifully. I'm very proud. Esther, will you? Oh, will you, Esther? Of course I will, John. Oh, gosh. Do you realize I might have lost you? A few more days and you'd have been gone. We might never have seen each other again. And now we're engaged. Esther, let's go home and tell your folks right now. Oh, no, uh, not tonight. I, I'd, I'd rather just the two of us knew about it tonight. Now, we're not going to let them talk us out of it. After all, we are of age. Well, practically. John... Even, even if I it did go to New York, we, we could still work something out somehow. Couldn't we, John? Merry Christmas, John. Merry Christmas, Esther. with you, Esther? Of course, darling. Come on now, cover up. You weren't asleep either, were you? Mm -mm. I've just been lying here, thinking. Was the dancing nice? Wonderful. I've been watching the moon so bright, but I haven't seen anything. Did he come? Did who come? Santa Claus. <laughs> now you know he's not going to come until you're fast asleep. Then sing to me, Esther. Sing to me till I'm asleep. All right. What kind of song, darling? A Christmas song. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. Next year all our troubles will be out of sight. Yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. Next year all our troubles will be miles away. Once a 
again as in olden days, happy golden days of yore. Faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us once more. Some. Day soon we all will be together. If the fates allow, until then we'll have to muddle through somehow. So have yourself a. Still awake? I can't go to sleep. I can't. Oh, Esther, how will Santa Claus know where to find us next year? We'll be in New York. Oh, you can't fool him. He can find anybody he wants to find. If he brings me any toys, I'm taking them with me. I'm taking my dolls and the dead ones too. I'm taking everything. Of course you are. You won't have to leave anything behind, except your snowman, of course. My snowman. What? We, we look pretty silly trying to get the snowman on the train now, wouldn't we? Snowman, my snowman. Tootie, come back here. My poor little snowman. What's going to happen to them? Snowman, snowman. Tootie, darling, it's, it's all right. It's all right. What on earth happened, Esther? What was Tootie doing in the backyard? She just ran out, Papa, and it started to smash all her snowmen. Nobody's going to have my snowmen. Not if we're moving to New York. Oh, don't cry, darling. You can build other snowmen in New York. No, you can't. You can't do anything in New York like you can in St. Louis. You sure she'll be all right? Yes, Papa, you go back to bed. I'll take care of her. Well, good night, Esther. Good, good night. Tootie, darling, New York's a wonderful place. Wait till you see the fine home we're going to have and the friends we're going to make. But the main thing, Tootie, is we're all going to be together, just like we've always been. That's what really counts. We could be happy anywhere as long as we're together. Anna! Anna, wake up! Rose! Grandpa, Lonnie, everybody, get up. Oh, Esther, Tootie, come on, all of you, come on downstairs. Uh, Papa, Papa, what's wrong? Everything's wrong. Anna, where are you? Grandpa, yeah. come downstairs this minute. Now, everybody get in here and sit down. There's nothing to sit on, Alonzo. Nothing but packing boxes. Then come into the dining room. I've got a few words to say to this family. Well, what, what is, is it, for heaven's sake? Well... We are not moving to New York. Oh, and I don't want to hear a word about it. We're going to stay right here in St. Louis till we rot. We haven't rotted yet, Alonzo. Oh, but what will you say to the firm, Papa, to Mr. Fenton? That I've changed my mind. I'm a junior partner, not a puppet on a string. But New York, Alonzo, you, you did think it was a fine opportunity, didn't you? Well, I, I was looking forward to going, yes. But after all these weeks, watching my family's hearts breaking and... And then Tootie a little while ago and... <laughs> well, New York hasn't got a copyright on opportunity. The trouble with you people is you don't appreciate St. Louis because it's right here under your noses. I'll take that. Hello! Is this you, Rose? Oh, I mean... Do I sound like Rose? Well, then get her to the phone. Wake her up or something. Now, just a minute, young man. Who do you think you're Papa, talking to? Papa, Papa, I... please let me take it. Hello. Rose Smith, I haven't slept a wink since I took you home from the dance, and I won't go on like this any longer. Warren. We're going to get married, and I don't want to hear any arguments. Now, that's final. Oh, I love you. Warren, but... Say? Warren. Anna, who is that boy? Do you know? Alonzo, he's a very fine young man. Now, we'll talk about it later. Oh, Rose, darling, you handle the whole thing magnificently. He's just putty in your hands. <sighs> well, I hope you'll be very happy, Rose. And sometime, if you can arrange it, I'd like to meet that young oh, fellow. Papa, Mama, 
if Rose is going to get married, maybe we had a, better open up her Christmas presents now. <laughs> oh, you little faker. It's your presents you're after. <laughs> He's been here. Santa Claus. Well, of course, in the living room. Oh, good heavens. It's Christmas morning. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Papa, you've given us the nicest Christmas anybody could ask for. We're staying in St. Louis. Good morning, Mr. Costello. Good morning, Tootie. Going to help me deliver ice today? Today? Do you know what today is? Sure do. First day of May, 1904. It's fair day, Mr. Costello. Today's the day the World's Fair opens. My family's going, and Papa says we're not coming home till they throw us out. Is that a fact? Well, gee up, me dress. But don't you worry. I'll help you deliver ice tomorrow. John, it's 8 o'clock. We promised to meet the family for dinner at the French Pavilion. Oh, we'll be there, Esther. I just didn't want you to miss this. Miss what, John? The electric lights. Look, Es, they're turning them on. Oh. Here they come. Oh. Oh. John, it, it, it's just breathtaking. I never dreamed anything could be so beautiful. Imagine there's never been anything like this in the whole world. That's right, Es. There's nothing like this. And no one like you, just think of all the things we'll have to tell our kids someday. I wonder if they'll believe it, John. I can hardly believe it myself. You and, and a World's Fair right here where we live. Right here in St. Louis. Before our stars return to the microphone... I'd like to tell you about Mrs. Brown. The Browns had some friends in for dinner recently, and after they finished, Mrs. Green said... Let's do the dishes now, Mary. I'll give you a hand. Oh, thanks. It really won't take long. Optimist. But I always say you can talk just as well in the kitchen as anywhere. Want me to wash? Oh, no. That's the easiest part. Who do you think you're kidding? Look at these dishpan hands of mine. Oh, I have Lux. You have? Where'd you get it? Down at the corner. Some came in while I was there the other day. Lucky. I haven't been able to get any lately. Mm, I guess you've just struck it wrong. We're all so sick of those strong soaps that Lux goes like hotcakes. Do strong soaps bother your hands, too? Do they? Why, mine looked worse than yours. But soon as I switched to Lux, they started getting better. Note that, Mrs. Green. Tests prove changing to Lux Flakes does just what Mrs. Brown says. It takes away that ugly dishpan redness. You'll begin to notice improvement in just a few days. Another thing, you have to use so much of that strong soap to get suds. I know. But you saw how little Lux Flakes I put in the dishpan. And look what rich suds they make. Those richer suds will actually go further, Mrs. Green. Do you know that ounce for ounce, Lux does up to twice as many dishes as other leading soaps tested? If I get my hands on a box of Lux Flakes, I'll go easy with it. I don't want to waste a spoonful. Yes, Lux is precious, Mrs. Green. Too precious to be wasted. Of course, you're disappointed when you can't find Lux Flakes right off. We're making as much as we can... But there just isn't enough to satisfy all our customers all the time. So please be patient and keep asking. When you do find Lux Flakes, you'll be delighted how soft and smooth they leave your hands, in spite of dishwashing. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Now that you've met them in St. Louis, we invite you to meet them as they are in real life. Tonight's delightful stars, Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake. Judy, we enjoyed both your singing and your acting. <laughs> well, Bill, tonight's play certainly puts one in the mood for Christmas. You know, Christmas is only 23 days away. <laughs> hey, that's pretty close figuring, Margaret. And, Judy, this will be the first Christmas for the newest member of your family. Have you bought the baby any presents yet, Judy? Well, I haven't done much shopping yet, Margaret. Judy's been pretty busy. It was just recently she finished her latest metro golden Mare Technicolor picture till the clouds roll by. And Margaret's been pretty busy, too. She's been appointed National Junior Chairman of the Infantile Paralysis Fund. Just three weeks and 48 hours until Christmas. <laughs> and during the Christmas holidays, Margaret, you'll have to see Tom Drake's new MGM picture, Courage of Lassie. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Margaret has one of Lassie's puppies. Is that right, Margaret? Yes, and I named him Laddie. But just think only 18 shopping days until Christmas. <laughs> 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 That's right, Margaret. And we've been doing some shopping on a play for next week. What are you presenting next week, Bill? Two brilliant stars who rank among our greatest favorites. 
Irene Dunn, and Walter Pidgeon. They appear in one of the screen's most entertaining comedies, Columbia Pictures' recent hit, Together Again. It's the fresh, delightful story of a woman torn between love and her career as a small-town mayor, a play I'm sure our audience will love. Well, Irene Dunn and Walter Pidgeon really make a great team, Mr. Keeley. And remember, only 20, 23 days until Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and remember, too, the days are getting shorter, Margaret. <laughs> Gee, that makes things even better. <laughs> Good night. Good, Good night. night. <laughs> and best holiday wishes to you all. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Walter Pidgeon in Together Again. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. More than two million servicemen returning to civilian life are homeless. Help out by making your extra rooms available to rent and by listing your sales or rentals with the Veterans Housing Center. Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Secret Heart. Heard in our cast tonight were Gail Gordon as Alonzo, Colleen Gray as Rose, Regina Wallace as Mrs. Smith, Norman Field as Grandpa, and Billy Roy, Noreen Gamil, Dick Ryan, Clark Gordon, Charles Seal, Truda Marson, Johnny McGovern, Joel Davis, Jerry Farber, Howard Jeffrey, and Lois Kennison. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Together Again with Irene Dunn and Walter Pidgeon. Spry, S-P-R-Y. For wonderfully light, fine, delicious cakes. Rely on Spry. For tender, flaky pastry. Rely on Spry. For crisp, golden fried foods. Rely on Spry. For all you bake and fry, it's Spry, the pure all-vegetable shortening. Rely on Spry, S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Together Again with Irene Dunn and Walter Pigeon.